I think for the first time in this conference, we only have males on the stage, and somehow I feel more secure. <laughs> we had a wonderful woman, panel, women panelists and keynotes, so it's actually strange to have an all-male panel. Um, can I ask you just to make you a bit more relaxed? Uh, this panel discussion will not be like the previous one. So, so. John and Kwesi and Herman, won't you just give us in one, two sentences who you are and what is your role in Tribal, in Standard Bank and in Skynet? Of course. Well, Paul, thank you uh, for the introduction. It's nice to be here, although I must admit I, uh, I sit down with some trepidation being a, a, a representative of a technology supplier uh, <laughs> after a debate that has ranged far and wide about the efficacy of that in all manner of ways. Uh, Tribal is a supplier of systems and software to education. We're proud to be working with UNISA, proud to be one of the sponsors of the conference. My own background is in universities. Um, I was a, most recently a deputy vice chancellor in Australia. I've been a chief operating officer of three UK universities, uh, including Wolverhampton, where I must have known John, but I'll go back to that later. Uh, and. Um, I joined Tribal some two years ago as managing director with responsibility for market development, customer liaison, business engagement, sales, etc. Just before I get to Kwesi, uh, is Tribal easier to manage than a university? Um, it's more straightforward in many ways, John. Uh, although Tribal is a very collegiate space, uh, it's an interesting corporate model whereby it does draw on the talents and energies of its people but it doesn't have the same collegial infrastructure that you have to respect and manage with and through as a university leader and administrator. Okay, great, thanks John. Kwesi, your role in Standard Bank. Hi, I'm, I'm Kwesi Dia, I'm from Standard Bank. We are a partner in, uh, and a banker to UNISA here in South Africa and uh, the biggest bank in by assets in Africa in more than 19 countries now. And my main role in Standard Bank, I look after clients in, in the oil and gas se sector in, in South Africa in the main, uh, but also support our colleagues who work with uh, institutions like, like UNISA to make sure that we are able to provide the kind of things that they would need uh, going into the future. I'm, uh, by, I'm not a finance person by any stretch of imagination. I'm by background, I was an engineer and I spent a lot of time doing public work, uh, pu public work development work in economic development before I joined, I joined the bank. Yeah. Great, thanks, Kwesi. Uh, Armand, just before we go get to you, just a note that Eugene Swanepoel is reflected on the PowerPoint, but Herman Evert has joined. Herman, your role is Skynet. Thank you. Um, uh, Skynet is a courier company, so we the humble postmen, when all the technology <laughs> fail, we <laughs> 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 we do the necessary. Um, I'm quite certain about my job at Skynet. I'm the envy, uh, so no doubts there. I was uncertain about my sex, but although I'm not your student, you confirm that you know me well enough to con uh, to make me female, so I'll or male. I'm not <laughs> sure now. I lost it. Um, but but that's in short. Skynet is a South African company. Proudly, level two BE, long-standing relationship with uh, with UNISA. I'm a UNISA graduate, so I, it has a very special place in my heart, and uh, I relate to the experience. And uh, you know, so for me, this this is quite a special place. And serving them, I think my capital has a bit more conscience when it works with uh, UNISA. Okay, great. How I will structure this panel discussion is um, we ask you to prepare a short presentation. I think the audience was most probably tired of my facilitation skills. So we will start with John, um, and he will share for about 10 minutes his views on, and the John's title is Long-Term Stability in the High Education Business Learning Sector, and how this can be achieved through the use of analytics and management information, John. And then we will move to Kwesi that, that reflects with us on distance education, a catalyst for innovation and access in a networked world. You already hear the themes going through. And then we get to, to Herman that 
that will share with us some thoughts on towards solving the apparent dichotomy between supply chain optimization and the needs of the student. So very, very relevant topics for our conversation. John, you first sure. up, please. Thank sure. you very much. Let's give a hand to John Bolton. Thanks, Paul. Um, as I say, it's um, I, with some trepidation that I uh, I talk about this uh, now. I, I, I was conscious that the previous panel ended by talking about knowing students uh, and a very interesting few minutes around that. This is all about knowing your students. The piece I'll, I'll spend 10 minutes on now, it's about using analytics to understand better the student journey. Um, when I was getting mic'd up, I, I must admit, I was thinking when Paul asked his question of the other panel about, you know, your experience is good and bad. The young fellow who was micing me up said to me, uh, John, he said, do you mind if I change your batteries? I thought that'd be a great thing to do if you could change your batteries and get yourself psyched up as well as mic'd up for a, a session like this. That would be rather wonderful. So I chose Paul colleagues to interpret stability uh, in the context of, of one particular question, which is why do we lose students? Why do students drop out? Because that's an issue that's challenged educators, be they frontline academics or administrators, uh, for a long time. And in trying to answer a question why students drop out, first need to understand solutions to a, a range of other issues. Which students are more likely to drop out? which students could make better progress, what factors impact on student outcomes. I, I think those things were kind of um, evidential in the previous conversation. And although technology and its use was quizzed a little in the previous session, I think the intelligent use of big data uh, can hold the key to identifying students that need support, that need assistance, uh, and we can make that support more personal for them. That, yes, increases retention rates, and there are fiscal uh, outcomes to that, but it nurtures talent, it pushes up attainment, and hopefully it improves the student experience. So, just briefly, um, the landscape is changing, and the, the factors on the left of the, the diagram, as you look, the external factors, the competitive environment that we see for our institutions the world over, um, the second point is a uniquely UK point about taking caps off student numbers and allowing recruitment to run free, happening in Australia as well, but elsewhere in the world, different interpretations of that. Most students are paying. Often they see themselves paying rather a lot for their education. There's more choice, there's more expectation as to what they uh, want to get from their higher education. Um, the institution wants to retain students, increase their success, uh, make sure it keeps its attractive position in the market, and at the end of it, gives them something for their experience, often measured narrowly through employment, but not always. And the point is that as institutions, you collect an enormous amount of data about students. Most of that structured data is held on a student information system, the likes of which we're working with UNISA on, but it's created as a byproduct of the student's engagement in their institution whether it's through the BLE, their use of the library, their attention to sports clubs and societies, other clubs and societies, etc. All that data, that big data, gives us lots of information about how students are engaging with their university, with their program. But it's challenging to use that data because of the difficulty of collecting and analyzing such large data sets. They contain patterns, relationships, trends, that are difficult to spot with traditional methods. And the challenge to us, I think, as modern institutions is how we spot those patterns, how we interpret them, and then how we use them. And the truth is, I think, that those data patterns can be used to help academic colleagues, support staff, identify earlier students at risk, and predict the likely outcomes. Secondly, we can look at them in a descriptive way to help the general issues that are affecting student outcomes. The burning questions and those where data analytics can help us are which students are more likely to drop out, who could make better progress, the factors impacting, what they need help with, 
and ultimately making support more personal. I, I've been a distance learning student. I did one of my qualifications with the Open University in the UK. Um, the Open University was pretty good actually at making my experience personal, despite me not being on campus often during that program. I think it's a general issue for education institutions, but specifically for distance uh, students. And it does, I think, take us back to the end point of the previous session, knowing our students. Graphically, you can look at it like that. Collect data, mine that data, create models, think about patterns, relationships, trends, and behaviors, predict and understand. Um, as part of our provision as a partner, we have a module called Student Insight, which is our learning analytics platform, which does all of this using data mining and machine learning techniques to create those predictive models. I think Paul said earlier that knowing students isn't cheap. Um, no, it isn't. This technology, though, is not expensive, and once it's in use, it can be used right across institutions. No discrimination between different groups, different cohorts, different um, courses. Typically, uh, where we, we are using it with our partners in Australia, uh, in the UK, through an arrangement with the Joint Information Systems Committee, JISC, uh, we're seeing innovative early deployments that uh, are helping those institutions to begin to help predict and understand non-continuation and, and academic performance. Um, summing up and quickly, it's kind of in five phases. It's a five-stage process. Collecting data from any data source that contains in information about students and their interactions. Uh, identifying through the mining of that data um, to identify students who need those interventions. Uh, raising awareness through about issues affecting groups of students because of what we're finding out about issues that impact and affect them. Um, helping to facilitate the appropriate action, meetings with students, tutorial sessions, telephone calls, electronic interventions, uh, and then securing improvements um, so that we don't find ourselves making the same kinds of mistakes again. So in general terms, Paul as chair, colleagues, I wanted a quick 10 minutes to say, you know, analytics and the, the use of them in big data contexts can be helpful in delivering the best educational outcomes for your students at times of real challenge, uh, both for them and for us as educators. Why do it? Well, yet yeah, we leverage investment in our student information systems and the data we already hold. We get greater and more meaningful engagement, greater understanding of student needs. We identify students who are at risk and we try to do something about taking that risk away targeting strategic interventions rather than the more scattergun approaches that have characterized uh, many interventions in the past and driving student progression. They're key issues for educators, I think particularly for those of you involved in distance education generally. Thank you. Thanks, thanks John. Next on stage is Kwezi Tia from Standard Bank. Thanks, John. This is education, a catalyst for innovation and access in a networked world. Thanks, Crazy. Good, uh, good afternoon. Firstly, I must thank you, Nisa, for this type of a table. So I tend to compete with tables that are not see-through because of my height. Just, uh, I'll just cover a number of topics as to how we are looking at this issue of distance education and how it impacts, especially in service organizations like ourselves. I just want to disavow people of any fears. There is no discussion here about finance and balance sheets. Um, I'll just talk about what we see as the emerging topics in the, in the er area. And I'll, we're just going to use some understandings based on what UN UNESCO has done in trying to frame some of the issues. And we're then going to bring it to talk about innovation and the new world of work as we, as we see it. And we'll then talk about why we, we continue to have an interest in, in, in this area. I think some of this has been touched in the sessions that I, I listened to. 
I mean, I know the question of access was questioned as to whether it means justice, but we, we think those themes that you see, which were always about continuous improvement, continuous development, how you get people access, use education as a basis to try and get more equity, and the issue of a world that is much more networked, even though technology was questioned, it has particular enablers to the networking and how that whole process can be part of an inno innovation, innovation e exercise. We see that as the emerging themes in education gen general, but particularly for those of us who benefit a lot from distance education. And just to, to, uh, to talk about that a, a little bit further, you, you see in the world today, there's an increasing demand of people with the right types of skills. In particular, if you go back to the um, our understanding of what education is for, it's really to enable for, for us to have critical thought in the world. And for us who are in the working environment, distant education tends to provide the ba a basis for people to be able to access education to, to improve themselves or those who haven't been able to participate, they can start, start with it. And you see a world now, and you see it in South Africa as well, and there's, I mean, there's a demonstration in a, in a university today where you're finding limited resources either for physical infrastructure or enough resources for full-time education and how does this education play a role in providing an alternative, not necessarily an alternative avenue for people to be able to access education. And, and then the thing that also interests us is the issue of how distance education becomes a platform around people where they connect with the world and talk about issues of thinking of having education ac across geographies. We note the issues that were raised around whether curricula can be contextualized, but when people understand how to work across geographies, how, what does it mean for their preparedness in working in an environment where the world starts to value diversity a, a little bit more? And also the issue about how technology and other forms enable innovation in the workplace, uh, in the learning process, and also you transfer all of that knowledge into the workplace. I'm not gonna go into detail around the UNESCO, and I, I, assume, I, I, mean, I presume the audience knows better than me on this, and probably has been developing since uh, UNESCO made the declaration on higher education in 1998. But when they speak about from vision action, they, they talk about the number of themes there that are absolutely critical in terms of how we think and frame what it means for us to think about education, distance education in particular. Uh, and, for, and, and for us, what some of the most critical things that we pick up from there. If you look from a developing country context is how you start to think about the fact that you start to gain, you have a brain, a brain gain rather than a, a, a brain drain. The issue of being able to have different partners, this panel is a typical reflection of what that means. And also the issue of how you see education as access from a public service perspective. I think they go into detail about a number of things which are about how you shape a new vision in order to be able to, to talk about from going from, um, from vision to action. And I, we thought that that frames it a lot. And then they went from there and then they had a complementary discussion on something different, but we say it's complementary where they had the, the conference on the information society, which touches around the issue of technology slightly. And the issue about making sure that you've got equity and access from a technology perspective, and if you think about distance education, they, talk, they spoke there about the issue of narrowing the digital divide. And you think about how distance education using technology actually plays a role in narrowing that, digi that digital di divide because you're getting people to be more informed, more educated in the process. And they spoke about the issue of equitable access to information and data and building an international consensus, which is really all, all, is always about, ab about diversity. And then they spoke about a very, very important component about the issue of how this process, you need to look at, 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 at the issue of culture and think about education from the perspective of how you connect different nations and how you connect different cultures. And when you start to read this, it starts to make you think about, I mean, we, we always in business think that people are being educated for us, but they're actually being educated for society. We just become a beneficiary because you're just one element in society. And, and when we then move from that and think about innovation, Ernst and Young has identified probably four themes about what they're seeing as innovation in, in the business place, I'm talking about in a business context. For us to be able to understand our customers, we need to understand UNISA very well as our customer, for instance, as an example, in order to do very well for them. But the issue of our people and our culture and the kind of knowledge we do through our own research 
and how we then operate. But if you look at all those four things, all of them require learned people to be able to achieve them. But in particular, the second and third one, they are actually at the core of what education is able to give you. And you can link that back to the whole process of, of, of continuous imp improvement. I mean, that is why to us, this edu education is not a theoretical relationship. It's a very important practical relationship what we seek to have. And I've got a lot of points there, but the world that we are living in, in at work now, I mean, we're running an organization, for instance, that's in, in many countries on the continent and also with some offices outside of the continent. You, we need to master the art of working in a very decentralized way in which the, the head, the, the office or the desk is no longer the center, in which you are able to work across different geographies and have information flow uh, quite fast. And we've got an interest in how our own people continue to improve themselves. And we can't let them be out of work because we need them to be productive for us to continue to service customers. At the same time, we need them to improve themselves to be able to prepare for a much more complex future that we're gonna meet. And therefore, and also bringing in diversity as well, so the world in which we are now working is much more different to the old industrial era, which was a very command driven. And, and if you then look at the things that Deloitte has identified as one of the critical components around the new world of work, about leadership, issue of learning and, and development and culture and engagement. And all those issues are not so much about very, very technical things. And so they go back to the issue of how we see education as an important component of providing the people that give us the critical thought. And if you combine these things about the world of work, innovation, and, and decent education, you see how the issue of having the right leadership and putting people at the center of it, whether as employees or as, as students, is actually quite critical. You see a common theme around a network and a de decentralized society. I think as decent education providers, you probably see this even more than us because, I mean, your students are all over the world and you, you need to be able to connect and touch them. Uh, and I think I'll just leave you with this one as well. You might have spoke about this, but if we have to work in multiple ge geographies and be able to connect, the very nature of the work that you do in distance education forces you to, for your students to practice doing that. So when they come to work in an environment like ours, they are able to know how to work across different uh, borders, how to work in a decentralized fashion. They don't have to be taught that in the same way that somebody who's been sitting full time at school needs to understand how it works. And if you think about how we benefit, we benefit really because we end up having the right people. As I, saw it, I said, it's a tool that we use for distance education. Uh, even though we accept that education is not just for our own business. And also, we think it can provide an environment for where people are able to, to practice a lot what they have learned, in, both in terms of the tools that technology provides, but also in being able to work with different people across different geographies, thus enriching for us uh, the, uh, the experience, uh, the human experience of being able to provide services either as a business or, a, or as an organization. That is really where I wanted to end. Thank you. Thanks so much, Kwezi, and thank you for our speakers of respecting the time. I'm an effort uh, towards solving the apparent dichotomy between supply chain optimization and the needs of a student. Thank you, Herman. I think that's uh, the title of my talk. I had to practice the word dichotomy 12 times because, you know, where in the village I come from, that would be a word too big. Uh, but, but I thought I'll start somewhere here. Yeah, you know, people dream vaguely and resist in detail. And I think uh, Toffler said, you, you gotta think about big things while you're doing small things so that all the small things go in the right direction. Being only a courier, we are a very small, humble part of, of, of a very complex supply chain and, and education system. So for us, it's quite Im important to to do our little part as smart as we can. Because for me, the, the, the question of the bridge is, is, is probably the kind of picture that's in my head. We have a current system, whether it's good or bad, whether you like it or you don't, this is where you are. And to get to the future, you have to cross it. And for a while, until the river is subsided, you have to have a bridge. And 
the bridge for me raises the question of uh, the chariot strategy of the commons. Everybody uh, sort of have adversarial supply chain procurement practices, though researchers has proved them to be silly. They are still very much in the tender era effect. And it prevents the very partnerships that, that you speak about. And, and for me, the lesson is that optimize the entire supply chain, not individuals. It's the only way to actually do it. And you need to look at things like accessibility. And we'll talk a bit about that. But, but in the haves and have not society that we find ourselves, especially in South Africa, uh, it's very easy to design a supply chain for a wealthy student in the northern suburbs who has and PC and access and you know any supply chain will work. But to make a supply chain into a rural village that 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 gives them an equal service, that is a slightly more challenging uh, concept. We talk about speed, visibility. Supply chains essentially work best when density is optimized. It's a very simple game if you can get density, but density is a slightly complex, it's just not volume, it's also a couple of other things. But if we look at the traditional way of trying to solve the last mile or moving the physical part of, s of, of the study material, which is the bridge, you know, you can deliver at home, you can deliver to a business, we would love for everything to be electronic, but it's got this small little thing called accessibility. So the 3% that have it, it's wonderful. The other 97, they got a bit of a problem. Um, you can have UNISA depots, you can have mail service, but they all have shortcomings. And in essence, they're all trade-offs between what could be or what could not be. I, I have a bit of a different pictures. I think we need to go from or to and. There are different constructs of bridges. You know, they so you can have a highway and a bridge and wildlife if if you just think of it and an or. And for me, what if we could introduce different densities? A student has a life, they have a rhythm. So what if I can give a student a supply chain where they can hand in this assignment to a place that has accessibility? not drop it in some box somewhere. I wouldn't drop, as a UNISA student, if you ask me to drop my, my assignment in some unmanned post box, I would just say, are you mad? So they need to drop it somewhere where they have visibility of the assignment so that the custody of, of who has my assignment is never broken. The student wants trust. They want to speak to somebody. They need accessibility, it needs a footprint. So I can get the costs down without compromising. So in many of the service aspects that can be done. The way to do it, I think, and we've tested some of this, I think the academics refer to it as action learning, they tell me. But, but we've actually had, and we, we collected 117,000 assignments over 44 days using predominantly PEP, and PEP is quite important because it has a footprint that helps those who needs help most. It gives them access where it's most needed. And this is transitionable, you know, so f it can go from a Dropbox to an internet cafe and the future can be very different. But it, it gives the, the, the student a different service level. It has the potential to cut costs by not 10, 20 percent, but 30 percent, even more, without compromising. And it, it's simple, it just cuts some of the inefficiencies out of supply chain. If you look at the map, if I add the post office, which we will probably use as well, so we're actually going with the solution around the post office. We drop them off, we pick them off, pick them up, but the bit in the middle we can do with a different technology, and you can then have a public Pri uh, um, public private partnership where we use the best of the post office, the best of the courier, the best of technology, we have supply chain visibility and we can cut the cost by 30% and the fundamental service to, this, uh, to the student through a better supply chain would be better. In the interest of time, I'm going to stop there. Thank you.
Thank you, Sir Herman. That was the easy part of the panel discussion. <coughs> for, for the last 10 minutes, um, I would like to pose you two, two questions. You all have very different perspective in the supply chain on, and very specific roles. Um, increasingly, the world of work is no longer so certain. A huge number of our graduates are unemployed. They just don't find employment, not because their degrees are not necessarily good or applicable to the workplace. There is just no work. Official figures in South Africa, 24% officially unemployment. I suspect unofficially, possibly 40%. So internationally, there's issues like the casualization of work, zero contract hours, uh, people in the UK with free degrees doing waitering jobs. Um, so, so, so what is, how will higher education respond to the fact that the world of work quasi is no longer such a given, Herman? Mm -hmm. um, what should the higher education change, John? I mean, we can have the analytics, we can have the support and the UNESCO frameworks and everything. We can have the, the ecologies or the supply chain but in a system where there's in an economic downturn where there is no work, what, how would higher education from your perspective address this? Should we make our courses more skills-based? Do we still need four-year degrees, John? Mm. Should we go for, for shorter programs and almost nano degrees, sh shorter degrees? How would you respond if you were obese? Herman, I'm going to start with you and then to Kwesi and then to John. If you were the VC of a big open distance education institution and your students after graduation, after they spent eight years completing a five-year or a three-year degree and they can't find work, what will you change, Herman? Look, I'm, I'm very tempted to say yes to all of the above, but, but that, that would be a cop-out. No, I, I, you know, they, they say you have a degree, but you are a lawyer. And, and I think s the, the, there is something to be said for that. But I have a, a very young stepdaughter at university now. And, and there's big discussions as to what she should study. And all I tell her is you go to university to learn to think. And what you what subject you use to attain that skill doesn't matter. Go and learn to think, because a community of thinkers will eventually have jobs, pay things, and prosperity. Yeah. Wow, wow. Thanks. Crazy, would you like to respond to about that or add another layer? Actually, yeah, um, I'll just add there. I mean, there's always say great minds think alike of fools never differ. So just, I think for me, the challenge is not just the university challenge, to be honest. Firstly, I think we have allowed in society people who are very functionally driven to define what should be the out output of universities. Okay. And I, I just use my own work experience. We are very lazy, and I use the word we in the real sense. We are very lazy to be, I'm talking about in business now, we are lazy to be involved in the process of not necessarily training, but in the process of guiding, mentoring, and all of that, because we are expecting to get what is called ready-made packages. That's why I agree with, with him. And what you need to get, you need to get people who are able to think about processes. And then our, our responsibility is to guide them to what the output is that leads to the work that we've got to do. But because we don't want to do that, and we're all being trained more functionally, that is, so the failure to me is also partly at the societal level. Which then brings me to what I would say is a challenge to the university vice chancellor or anybody else who was asking for advice. I would say, think about how you get what I would say is a diverse, is a diverse graduate. Now, let me just use an example of some college that I read about, and I've, I've never been there, but I've just read about, I think it's called Havimad in the US. Western, maybe in the western part of the US, I think. It's an engineering college, but you never graduate there without doing a third of your programs in the social sciences. 
So those scientists, engineers who come out of there have a different view of the world than I would have come out when I did my engineering. It means that they are much more pre prepared for the complexities of the world than the average engineer who's only studied. I'm, just, I, I'm not saying that's necessarily the model, but the point I'm trying to make is, so the challenge for the university is how to bring students who are able to be diverse in their thinking, because the world that they are going to requires them to be adaptable. But our responsibility then means those of us who are at work, we need to change our approach and to then say we have a responsibility to do certain things to be able to bridge that, because it's not the university's responsibilities alone. Okay, thanks. Is John from your side? I think great answer. Uh, I wish all the universities that are closing departments of humanities and schools mm -hmm. of humanities have listened to you. Mm -hmm. John, from your perspective? I mean, I, I think my colleagues have given, as evidenced by the response from the audience, two powerful responses. I, I, I wonder if we're on a, a little bit of a journey. I think we've, we've had a period um, where the instrumental gain from a, a university education has been prominent, uh, even paramount in the minds of politicians, policy makers, and that's been absorbed by elements of the academy and indeed the customers, if I dare use that rather ugly word for, for students. And in the UK, for example, the increase in tuition was justified entirely on economic grounds that, you know, y you will benefit from your higher education, you will get a better job, therefore you should pay for it. So we've boiled it down to a very sort of instrumental monetarist con construct. I think what Herman says about thinking mm -hmm. is, is spot on and the way you built on that and, and talked about, you know, the, the availability of experience in a university is what I would be reflecting on as a vice chancellor. I'd be thinking of relevance, I'd be thinking of honesty in terms of what I was admitting students to and for. I, in my early career, um, I was part of... Um, a polytechnic in the UK that was quite groundbreaking in its approach to credit-based education in the early 80s. And we used to say, I'm not sure we always believed it, but we used to say that um, there were many ways to benefit from coming to the polytechnic. You didn't have to exit with an honours degree to have gained from your experience of a university uh, you know, moment. And, and we saw many of our students leave before graduation, but with diplomas or with certificates. They felt credentialed, they were proud, they were productive. They'd learn to think a bit more about their place in that messy world out there. So two powerful answers from my colleagues. Great stuff. The last question, very short, one sentence. Uh, Manuel Castells was quoted a number of times during this conference. He, he wrote a number of books on the information society, the network society, and a number, too many to quote. But one of his most profound quotes for me is, in a networked world, not everyone is connected, but everyone is affected. Can I just maybe say that again? In a networked world, not everyone is connected, but everyone is affected. Um, if that is true, how, do, how should higher education respond? Should we roll out ICT? Should we roll out critical literacies? Uh, you don't have all to, maybe that's possibly, should we increase net? How do we respond in a world where not everyone is connected and most probably will be connected, but everyone is affected? John, would you like to respond? And then Kwesi, and then we end with Herman, very short. Oh, no, no. The, the trouble is that Sometimes it's not your choice whether you're connected and, and therefore Good you're point. not always sure how you're affected by, by you know, the lack of connectivity. Um, I, I mean, I, I think there isn't a simple answer to that, that there isn't a kind of one-size-fits-all approach, therefore, to the use of ICT in learning, uh, the use of traditional models. It's somewhere about the blending of the two. Um, it's a, it's a great quote. Um, we could probably spend 45 minutes exploring <laughs> great, it. Yeah. Crazy, would you like to respond? Actually, I think the answer is in a combination of what Godson has spoken about earlier and part of what Herman presented. Where Godson spoke about understanding the students. He was, I think he used the indigenous people in, West, in the east, western part of Botswana. 
and then he used an example of what they are trying to do from a, a networking perspective. If you look at both of those, if you understand your students and you build the right partnerships that get you to reach the student, that to me would be what I would do as a university because then I go, I've got limited resources. Okay. But I must use them through understanding what my real uh, custodian, which is a student, need, needs to have. That's great. That to me would be where I spend my energy. Thanks, KJ. Herman, last word from your side. You know, I would climb up a bit higher on the mountain because, you know, is network Cisco or is network Ubuntu? I am through others. And, and I think if you say it's both, then we will understand that for students that can think and have the courage to, of their conviction, I think networks like that, an iPad might make it better but it surely does constitute. Okay, great. Colleagues, I could not have asked for a better end to, to this day, and I would like to, to, to thank Herman, Kwesi, and John. Let's give them a great hand.